Welcome to Market Revolution, the Early Industrial Age in America. This is Melinda Cole Klein. After the Revolution and the War of 1812, the Southern economy looked very much like it did in the colonial period. An agricultural social elite, with the availability of a reliable and steady workforce, resisted the impulse to industrialize. By 1816, Jefferson advised his fellow Republican Democrats to encourage economic growth to which industry was stressed. In the time of war, the nation had to possess the means and ready supplies to defend itself. And as history has shown us, war has no time restrictions. It could happen at any time. The young republic experienced times that would come to resemble a bumpy road. Economic recovery was stunted in New England and New York in 1816 with the year of no summer. This event was quickly followed by the speculation in land and rise in cotton prices resulting in the panic of 1818. Similar to the development of mercantilist impulses during the colonial period, industrialization began to take form for the most part in urban towns or nearby outlying areas. Unlike the traditional family-based economies, the families worked for wages. While it seemed as a secure source of income, it affected family roles, parental authority, created a dependence on child labor, and increased poverty levels for those employed at factories as unskilled labor paid low wages. At the onset of this post-war era, in 1816, the economic hub of trade and commerce was deeply challenged. Its economic survival was imperiled as the climate through New York and New England, along with southern Canada, did not cooperate. During the Little Ice Age, this would be a time from about the early 1300s to 1850. Populations experienced extreme periods of cold that fluctuated with cooler than normal temperatures than enjoyed in the 900s to about 1300. For 500 years, humans suffered with crop failures, malnutrition, and death. 1816 was such a year the year with no summer. The years between 1805 and 1820 were for the most part Europeans as far as their records it was the coldest. In 1812 Charles Dickens was born and grew up during the coldest decade in England since the 1690s. Researchers believe the volcano explosion of Mount Tambora on April 11, 1815, on the eastern end of the island of Java, set into motion climactic events. What causes the climate to change? First, scientists do not agree on the variables or that change is not normal. Not enough is known, and it might be normal for the climate to shift every 500 years, more or less. However, there are following four items that I would like you to consider that scientists agree might be the causes. Decreased solar activity. Number two, increased volcanic activity. Number three, internal, otherwise natural fluctuation of the Earth's climate system that little is known. And number four, is the influence of human beings and our impact that we make on the earth. During the Little Ice Age around the world, populations experienced unusual cold weather, extreme wet or dark conditions, and at times crops would freeze with unseasonably cold frostbites, 
such as in New England in 1816, in addition to hailstorms and heavy rains. The Little Ice Age caused shorter growing seasons because of low temperatures and cloudy conditions. Crops did not mature for harvest. People went hungry, causing malnutrition, reducing the effectiveness of the immune system, and this led to many deaths. During the 40 years after 1815, the United States defined itself as a nation for the people in regards to liberty and commerce. The nation's boundaries expanded. America was changing with innovations and access to land and resources. The speed at which people did things changed with new time-saving inventions. State and federal funding of transportation systems helped large and small business owners grow in a demanding and expanding economy. Private companies risked expansion by building steamships, making the shipping of cumbersome heavy loads such as cotton from the humid south to new textile mills in the north possible to make cloth for domestic and international markets. The years between 1815 and 1855 did not provide a smooth transition to a capitalist economy through the age of industrialization. Rather, it experienced revolts, rebellions, panics, depressions, poetry, songs, wars, migration, and a high influx of famine immigrants and others seeking their freedom from enslavement and forced labor. All the while, the population increased. In 1815, it was 8.4 million. By 1850, it was 31.4 million Americans. From the 1780s, American economists and politicians argued in favor of a blended, market-oriented economy. Industrially speaking, the U.S. lagged behind England until after the Napoleonic Wars. This is founded on two principles. First, in the colonial period, American industry was located on a small scale within family households. This would include such industries as fisheries, distilling, brewing, specialized artisan crafts, shipbuilding, and whaling. After the War of 1812s, this event woke Americans up to the fact to remain independent, they would have to become an industrial power. By 1815, industrial production in the Northeast grew fast and their products found a healthy domestic and foreign market economy. Local craftsmen and artisans benefited too because mills processed lumber and ground grains into flour at faster rates by harnessing water power along the many rivers in the Northeast. In New England, the textile industry was the most dramatic example of industrial growth. The cost of clothing fell as small factories grew bigger, employed farm people, found new markets, and paid low wages to migrant workers. What would become obvious was that Americans did expand their economic endeavors along the same lines that had already been done, such as the utilization of water power to provide a much needed source of energy to run mechanized machinery. In innovation practices in early empires and throughout the Middle Ages, Americans employed the power of water in particular to power industrial textile factories. Thus, early industrialization using machinery became best suited on or near rivers. Like in England, the first mass-produced, marketable items were made of cotton cloth. Small water-powered factory mills spun yarn and wove cloth after the revolution. 
talented young artisans came to America to create their own textile mills. One such individual was Samuel Slater, an American who had apprenticed in England and his mill dates from 1793. One of the oldest and longest running in American economic history, Slater hired impoverished children and women while men protested. As anticipated by his critics, the Slater mill grew into a disorderly and dirty place in which to live and work, similar to some of the mill towns of England, such as Manchester. Mill towns created company-owned housing, stores, and places of worship to which the companies could control not only wages but the overhead for families including rent and food prices. Another industrial project created was by Francis Cabot Lowell. Lowell on a visit to factories in northern England and Scotland stole the English patent technology by studying factory machines during the day and writing extensive notes in the evening. In time, Lowell and his staff would create working weaving machines that were installed in Massachusetts. A very interesting book to read in regards to the history of New England mill industry is William Moran's The Bells of New England, published by St. Martin's Press in 2002. While mill towns were renowned for their unclean conditions, family poverty, and hopelessness, some mill towns, such as those in Lowell, Massachusetts, created healthier company towns. This could be done by regulating leisure activities, hiring workers from farming families and not from urban slums, creating supervised boarding houses, removal of industrial and town waste, and possessing a church. All the while, manufacturing with its rock-bottom prices would drive family businesses producing similar products out of business as they could not compete on the open market. Drinking on the job and established work environment practiced from the Middle Ages was now against the rules. In a society in which fresh and clean drinking water was not yet available, this made life most difficult. With industrialization and machines at the workplace, new business practices emerged specifically targeting the working class. Drinking alcoholic beverages among factory laborers, including men, women, and children, was frowned on by the middle class business sector because they feared alcohol kept them from their duties. So with industrialization, drinking on the job no longer had a place at work. After 1815, the demand for raw cotton by English textile manufacturers took off. Business owners in return responded to market demands. For the first time in human history, the resounding choice by customers worldwide was clothing made of cotton. Cotton clothes were cheaper, easier to sew and wash and weave, more comfortable in warm weather. Cotton cloth dyed more evenly, and it kept its colors longer. Other textiles used in industrial England and the Netherlands since the Middle Ages were typically of the two forms. Number one, linen, made from the fibrous hemp plant. Number two, wool, shorn from sheep, kept as livestock in Europe. From the Middle Ages to about 1800, European American women married with youthful training to spin wool into thread and in turn weave the thread into cloth used to create a variety of household textiles. It would not be until about after early part of the 1800s that cotton printed cloth was readily available at affordable costs. 
This allowed most women to free themselves from the long hours at the spinning wheel. A market-oriented economy demanded cities with immigrant populations. Between 1840 and 1850, 1 1.5 million Europeans arrived in North America. A popular entry port was New York City. By 1850, half of the residents in New York City were new immigrants. Few immigrants went to the South. Many immigrants were poor, unskilled, and Irish. By 1860, in America, 1.5 million were Irish-born and 1 million German. Many Irish women worked in factories, kitchens, and wage earnings as cooks and maids. Jews and the Irish tended to stay in large cities. Germans, Swedes, and Scandinavians, however, arriving with some money, agricultural or skills in a knowledge base to run their own economy, such as a dairy or brew house, headed west for Ohio, Minnesota, Illinois, and Indiana along with Colorado and Missouri a little bit later. Germans came primarily in family groups, unlike the majority of Irish immigrants who came as individuals or mixed groups of adults and children, having survived long enough to immigrate from the potato famine in Ireland. Past and present, immigrants drove down wages and created more unemployment as new arrivals were willing to work for any wage. A series of events combined to halt some economic growth in the United States by the end of the decade. Prices for cotton after 1815 drove real estate land values in the southeast, specifically cotton regions of the south, sky high. As the world demanded cotton, speculators purchased land with inflated values based on future profitability. The largest supplier to England's textile manufacturing companies, cotton prices rose to satisfy inflated plantation overhead. Banks gave southern gentlemen farmers the money to buy more land and plant more cotton selling it domestically and importing the rest. When cotton prices rose by 1818 through 1819, British manufacturers turned to cotton grown in their own protectorate nations, India and Egypt. American cotton prices tumbled along with cotton land values. Banks closed because they went bankrupt. Cities were hit hardest. About 500,000 people became unemployed as workers lost their jobs because businesses came to a halt. Textile factories failed as well. Many Americans wondered how safe their new republic actually was. All the while, the Deep South was taking on characteristics in which slavery became further entrenched and dependent upon the production of labor-intensive industries. These industries included the production of rice, cotton, indigo, and tobacco. Meanwhile, older plantation families of the Chesapeake Bay Area transitioned from single crops to cattle and the growing of grains. These industries required little in the way of labor especially where mechanized machinery was present. The Industrial Revolution affected traditional roles of men and women. Many couples married earlier as soon as they could afford to set up housekeeping. In the Western and Northern European tradition, men and women did not live as married couples until they could afford to have a home of their own. Today and yesterday, not all young ladies can find suitable husbands. Population turnover due to disease, war, 
and dangerous jobs such as fishing, along with out-migration, moving away, complicates this situation further. Most working-class men, journeymen artisans, and small business owners married for the first time to women usually a few years younger, after establishing himself in trade or in business. Oftentimes young men and women married into families of means and property, as in Western culture, heritage brings monetary rewards. It was not unusual or rather prudent to marry one's son to a daughter of an equally prominent family. This was typical and expected of parents in setting the heady responsibility of partnering up young people in a marriage. As industrial capitalism replaced mercantile capitalism after the American Revolution, this resituated many men away from home as they conducted business, especially for men in management positions outside of the home. With the place of business no longer located in the home of urban societies, women specialized in their duties as wife and mother. Out of this emerging middle class, which was more secular and operated in a market-based economy, a woman's role politicians and intellectuals argued, became recentered within the home, with the children, and in creating a solid home environment for husband and the children. This intellectual movement became known as the cult of domesticity. This was a prevailing view during the Jacksonian era of the 1820s and beyond that a woman's role in marriage was the following. Number one, maintain the home as a refuge for her husband. Number two, train the children. And number three, set a moral example for children to follow. The cult of domesticity falls in line with Republican motherhood ideals. A woman's proper place is within the confines of her family. She was responsible for her family's character. She was not to be in business or at college. President Jackson did not believe women were capable of rational thought and should be placed so far away from politics and business as possible. Jackson, like so many other Southerners, including George Washington, believed women to be a big heart but short on rational decision-making abilities. This line of reasoning kept women out of the universities until later in the century. New England politicians argued quite the opposite. Women had shown during the colonial period to be capable managers of a range of activities inside and outside of the home. They should be allowed to attend university and hold professional jobs, such as doctors and lawyers, etc. But the more conservative cult of domesticity became the accepted view of women's roles. As compared with the colonial era under mercantilized capitalism, women had been noticeable members of the business community. However, in the Republic, this facet of business began to shift to a male domain, excluding women. This trend began to reverse itself in the 1970s and the 1980s. Today, 45% of U.S. businesses are women-owned, and women once again are a noticeable feature of the economy. The market revolution transformed family roles and household tasks. With new inventions such as the cast iron stove, families developed a taste for foods inspired by French cooks, cakes, pastries, and fancy foods. New intricate baking styles complicated the lives of middle class cooks, either for wives or hired domestic servants trained as cooks. 
Although women no longer spun their own thread and yarn at home after 1812, with the availability of cheap cotton cloth in markets, families were expected to dress cleaner and in a neat fashion. This required that women would spend more time mending, sewing, washing and ironing than in previous generations. While the Industrial Revolution brought manufactured goods to market, domestic cleanliness went up. Expectations were to have a spotless home and just so in dressing. Home life took on new notions of privacy, comfort, and a distant safety from public life. Families started using matched sets of dishes, had separate rooms for sleeping, and yes, sex, along with eating, meeting, studying, and bathing. Many families decorated homes with wallpaper and upholstered furniture. This happened on farms by the 1840s and earlier in towns and cities. Sex was made more private for the average couple than in any other time across history. While managing the household was the primary responsibility of the wife. Husbands, those with good math skills, became a part of a growing white collar industry specializing in the following. Number one, banking as clerks and managers. Number two, accounting in financial institutions and the selling of insurance. And number three, record keepers of inventory in city import-export wholesale firms. With men leaving home for white-collar work as clerks and in management jobs more and more, this separated men and women into different daily roles. This further centered the man into solidifying his role as leader slash provider and the woman as the spiritual and loving center of the home. White collar skilled laboring fathers brought home more income than skilled laborers but not more than craftsmen. The end of the Napoleonic Wars enabled economic growth of European countries and in the United States. Distances between towns and villages shrank. With the building of roads and canals, rural economies benefited from a healthy post-war economy. The speed of communication greatly reduced the time it took to make decisions on business deals and purchases with the implementation of the telegraph by the 1840s. Using a system of dots and dashes, Americans, like their European counterparts, began to, to communicate across the vast distances with the investment by governments following its invention. The language spoken across the wires connecting one telegraph office with another was Morris Code. And the nation had a transcontinental wire service enabling telegraphs to be sent in minutes from coast to coast by 1861. The use of the telegraph did not only spur the domestic economy, but international trade as well. During the reign of Queen Victoria, by 1866, the transatlantic telegraph cable connected direct communication with England and the United States. While the wires could be easily cut or tampered with, the system offered expansion of the market economy link on rural markets such as cattle drivers making it to St. Louis with urban markets, along with the telegraph connecting them with meatpacking factories, for example, in Chicago, as which they would receive an arrival of a telegram from the cattlemen, asking them when to load the cattle onto the right railroad line, 
and when they should expect their money payment. Trade was aided by the new government. Under President Monroe, he used protective tariffs to benefit U.S. manufacturing, build roads to tie newly expanded market towns and farms together, and connected abundant river and lakes with a series of canals. For example, in New York State in 1815, engineers built 5,000 miles of gravel roads that helped to speed transportation. Muddy roads were difficult to use in wet weather, impeding the movement of goods and people over long distances. Other state governments got involved putting engineers to work on bridges, canals, and roads. Between the introduction of the steam engine and the telegraph, these innovations expanded the national economy, helped to establish towns and settle populations across the nation, and fostered coast-to-coast -coast connections regarding business to politics to travel interests. The transportation revolution brought a dramatic reduction in time and money spent moving heavy goods. Overall, the cost of moving goods across long distances between 1815 and 1860 dropped by 95 percent. Improvements in speed were dramatic. In 1815, it took 52 days to get from Cincinnati, Ohio to New York. Steamboats and canals cut the traveling time to 28 days. When train travel was added to the route, it dropped it to 18 to 20 days. And then, by 1852, it was possible to take a six-day train ride from Cincinnati to New York City. Such improvements in speed and modes of transportation made a national market economy possible. And with speed and moving people and goods, the idea of time and fixed locations no longer applied. Concepts of human difference were promoted by scholars. Most of them were scientists. In America, whites had stereotyped blacks as ignorant and prone to drunkenness and violence. But whites also maintained a parallel view of blacks as loyal and self-sacrificing servants. Views of blacks after the Nat Turner Rebellion shifted. This negative view promoted blacks as an incompetent, untrustworthy, and secretive. Individuals that could pretend to be loyal to the families and children whom which they cared for while awaiting the chance to steal from or poison them. These philosophies had long-lasting effects. Politicians argued blacks were unfit citizens of the white republic. Even hotter on the political topic was suffrage. Should free blacks vote? The majority, including Abraham Lincoln, believed that blacks needed exclusion from full citizenship in efforts to protect the nation, while a limited few spoke out against. The Second Great Awakening professed the idea that slavery was morally wrong. From 1831, The Liberator by William Lloyd Garrison published, took up this position in his abolitionist newspaper. By 1833, Garrison and others formed the American Anti-Slavery Society. They found great support in New England, New York, Northern Ohio, places where the market revolution had its greatest effects of industrialization. This small yet vocal political group demanded the immediate release of blacks, which would total millions of individuals, and to recognize them as full citizens. However, this was not the opinion of the majority of the American population. As compared with plantation societies in South America and the Caribbean, in the U.S., slaves rarely revolted. 
resulting in armed conflict because plantation societies themselves were well armed. In addition, plantations were spread out across the South, making slave revolts difficult to organize. A more common form to express the displeasure of the slave system was to run away. Others opposed slavery by lagging at their work duties, pretended to be sick so they did not have to work. Others deliberately damaged farming tools. Most slaves understood that to revolt was most likely would result in their death. Christianity and its teachings convinced African Americans as bonded workers that the slave system would end. But slave preachers such as Nat Turner rarely carried out armed rebellions using violent means. Enslaved Christians taught that it would be God who would end this lifelong bondage. Therefore it was their role to believe and have faith in God, to take care of each other, and to wait deliverance like the Jews under Roman rule. Southern states were increasingly worried about black slaves in their midst. This facet of Southern life was compounded with the anti-slavery movement in the North from the 1830s. In 1830, Nat Turner, a plantation slave, was convinced it was his destiny to end slavery in Virginia. With his black brotherly militia, using farm tools and knives along with stolen horses, this short-lived bloody revolt resulted in close to 80 deaths of whites, including women and children. This event shifted Virginia laws, movement of blacks, and their access to religion. To whites, enslaved blacks had the full potential to become violent or to kill at a moment's notice. The cotton industry in the South was profitable. While spiritual leaders and liberal newspapers wrote about the evils of slavery to an emotionally receptive reading public in the North, in the South the view of blacks took on new meanings after this Virginia slave revolt led by Nat Turner came to make history. This new legislation in Virginia in reaction to the Nat Turner Rebellion includes the following three points. Number one, after 1831, it was unlawful to teach a black slave to read or write. Number two, it was unlawful to allow blacks to travel off their plantations or without permission. Number three, it was unlawful for blacks to congregate for any reason, including religious purposes. With the Industrial Revolution and the influence of religious revivalism, the culture continued to change. The Second Great Awakening promoted middle-class reformers to close saloons, to encourage a sober working force, to regulate and enforce no commerce on Sundays, and to promote other reforms such as compulsory grammar school education while voting and taxpaying Americans were against higher taxes to educate the poor. The American educational system found itself in trouble with apprenticeship in decline. While the shift from execution to incarceration took over a century, the process moved from physical punishments, such as branding, to the death penalty, to locking up criminals in individual cells. In theory, if criminals were singularly exposed long enough to a Bible and its moral teachings, the criminal would become penitent. He or she would be sorry for what they did. Middle-class reformers saw and promoted criminals as lacking childhood moral nurturing. If re-educated in Christian principles, reformed criminals would be ready to take their place in society by becoming self-supportive and self-regulating. By the 19th century, corporal punishment was not working. 
in free societies, taking away a criminal's freedom is a worse pain than the lessons taught to civil society with public executions. Middle class reformers believed it best to rid society of its social ills and hide them from the public eye. These unsavory sorts did not deserve to live in a civilized society with its freedoms and civil liberties. As corporal punishments decreased, lengthy prison sentences were substituted. This meant building facilities to house the felons who, under prior laws, would have been executed or maimed. In America, Britain, and France, this alternative proved very costly to taxpayers. In other ways, Americans, like their industrial European counterparts, began to institutionalize portions of the population that did not adapt or fit in neatly with the ideals of the market-oriented family, for one reason or another. Other unsavory persons who resisted or could not conform to the new pace of industrial work were locked up. This would include the insane, the deformed, either by war or by birth, the sick, the poor, considered too lazy to properly support themselves, and, as mentioned, the criminal. In 1822, President Monroe urged Congress to recognize the emerging new republics of Latin America. He worried that France, Spain, and Russia would make renewed efforts to colonize the continent. While Europeans found the Monroe Doctrine arrogant, these countries were exhausted from war with Napoleon and did not want to provoke a war with the United States over this issue. The Monroe Doctrine became law in 1823. However, the Monroe Doctrine did not exclude U.S. involvement in Latin American politics. The mandate stipulated European powers should not interfere with emerging Republican-style governments in Latin America which proved to be heavily militaristic and typically run by dictators. These areas formerly had belonged to the 400-year-old Spanish Empire. The Monroe Doctrine was, or is, more of a threat of war than anything else. As you can see in this image, the German Kaiser, unnamed in this cartoon, and John Bull, the long-standing character meant to represent Englishmen or the English government interests, used in recruiting posters and other political cartoons. It seems Germany was most interested in planting their flag in the emerging republics in Latin America as well. And as always, you can see Uncle Sam here pictured on the right in his striped pants.